sanctuary for you. Oh Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. To inspire us and uphold the foundation of every nation, big and small, young and old. All are Welcome. It's so good to uh, be with all of you right now here. So many of you joining us this evening for this uh, event uh, that the Olam uh, Steering Committee has prepared for you. And I just want to open up and, uh, with uh, some words of Torah and some prayer for all of us. It's just wonderful to see all of you here uh, today. I'm, 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 it's taking me a moment because I'm rolling into uh, my screen to see the many, many of you that are here with us. Uh, and it's, it's in, I'm incredibly uh, moved, incredibly moved to be with all of you. So imagining us all together at this time. A reminder that you get to choose what you see you get to choose if you want to see everybody, and that's uh, uh, with the uh, gallery view, or if you want to see the person speaking, uh, which is the speaker view, and that allows you, you can do that on the right side on the top of your uh, Zoom. So again, it's just wonderful to be with you. Um, and I want to just open up with the first words of this week, Parsha, which we are going to be reading, which is Parshat, and it's the uh, final preparations of the use of the tabernacle and it's the lighting of the menorah. Uh, the parashat starts with by Daver Adonai el Moshe Emor Daver el Aaron Vamarta elav vealotcha et anerot el mul pnea menorah yairu shibat anerot. Adonai spoke to Moshe saying, speak to Aaron and say to him, 
When you mount the lamps, let the seven lamps give light in the front of the lampstand. And it goes on and on. So all the details of the importance of the menorah uh, in the tabernacle. And um, I just want to take that image for us of lighting the menorah, lighting uh, the lamps. And, and the word, there's one word I want to lift up from this pasuk, which is the word mul, el mul, in front. And what does it mean to put this light in front that guides you uh, to, to life? What does it mean to actually walk through this light? And what does it mean uh, to lead the way with light? And uh, I've been feeling very strongly lately that one of the, uh, the roles of us in our community is to lead the way. It's not just to follow uh, the right thing to do, but to lead the way. And I feel incredibly blessed that our community and many members, many of you here, feel um, this way, that can really uh, fully um, feel that you lead the way, that we get to lead the way of what does it mean to bring light to this world. So that's my bracha, that's blessing with us, that not, we are not only following the light, but we are leading with the light, mul. We are bringing it up front. And with that, I want to pass it to Fran Adams, who um, uh, is going to be opening for us at the evening. Thank you, Rev Claudia, for the light that you provide to all of us. And thank you so much, everyone who is here tonight. We are gathered during an extraordinary time of anguish in our country. The streets are on fire with people of color begging law enforcement to literally stop killing us. Long-standing systemic racism is finally on the front page of our newspapers. And at long last, all of us, black, brown, and white, are filling the streets demanding change. At the same time, we have all kinds of other things going on. Record numbers of people are out of work. The coronavirus is showing us that how many Americans have no health care or inadequate health care that they really can't afford. And the lines of hungry people at food banks stretch for miles while the richest continue to amass more and more wealth. The most consequential election of our lives is just months away with enormous obstacles to the traditional get out the vote activity. The pandemic is keeping us separate when we most need to unite. So that is what we are calling the urgency of now, the urgency of this very moment. TVC has been amazing at keeping us connected during this pandemic, but as we're all learning, some things are easier, easier to do under lockdown than others. Our Tikkun Olam group is committed to taking communal action on issues that we care deeply about, but we haven't been as active as we'd like to be lately for obvious reasons. Tonight, with your help, and there are so many of you, we want to change that dynamic. After all, Tikkun Olam is part of our birthright. It's in our Jewish DNA. The action that we've chosen to do tonight is one of the ways so many TBZers have been participating in resistance during the past three years, by writing postcards encouraging people to vote. And I recognize a lot of faces here from our monthly TBZ gatherings that have sadly come to an end, where we together we've written thousands of these citizen to citizen postcards and letters. That simple act is still one of the most impactful things that you can do right now, as you'll hear much more about later tonight. But that's just one of the many strands that we're working on. What you see now is the list of the Tikkun Olam steering committee, with, and now, maybe not, uh, here it is, okay? Um, so each of these folks um, helped to lead an action group that's devoted to issues such as climate change, healthcare, criminal justice reform, housing, immigration, and asylum. We have some brand new action groups that really need you, working on gun violence prevention, economic justice, and probably the most potent in this moment, 
a racial justice initiative just about to be launched. There are lots of ways for you to jump in um, and, and get involved with us and have, oh, hello, <laughs> and have the chance to enact the foundational principle that we all share, which is to heal our broken world. So here's how the rest of the evening is gonna go. We are so fortunate in this community to have such talented members. And tonight we'll be hearing from one of them. Jed Sugarman is a law professor at Fordham Law School, the author of The People's Courts, and he's now working on, the hist on a history of presidential power, as well as a book on the rise of mass incarceration. Talk about timely. But my favorite way to encounter Jed is when I'm innocently sitting on my couch at home watching MSNBC and there's Jed explaining some le legal wrinkle. Or when I open my morning paper and there's Jed's byline on a New York Times op-ed. Tonight, Jed will highlight for us the current risks to our democracy and answer the age-old question, why is this election different from all others? Jed will highlight um, the, yeah. So then we will have a Q&A uh, to, to really dig a little bit deeper, after which we will go into, we'll move into breakout rooms for some small group discussion and a chance to hear what's on your mind and in your heart at this difficult moment. We will then reconvene as a large group, hear about our postcarding action, and hear about other opportunities to engage right now in social justice. Ready? Here's Jed. Great. Well, Fran, thank you so much uh, for that introduction and for all your leadership uh, with the Tikkun Olam Steering Committee, uh, which has just been a, such a, a, a powerful resource and a, a wonderful community here within a community. And, and Rob Claudia, thank you for your words. And Rob Tufera, thank you for all of your organizing uh, behind the scenes here to make this technology happen. Um, and so let me first say uh, that this, that TBZ as a religious institution, it uh, has rules about um, its political engagement. So this talk I'm giving is within a nonpartisan framework. I'm mainly going to talk about democracy as its own value and the value of participation. And I'm going to really focus on the importance of making sure that every vote is counted in an election like none other for a number of reasons. Obviously the stakes are so large, um, and, but I think there are several other reasons why this election is unique in American history. Uh, not just because of the stakes, but also because of the pandemic and because of unprecedented potential for law enforcement to be used not for protecting the ballot, but for making it more difficult for ballots to be counted. And I wish I could say that that is historically unprecedented. I wish I could say that it really is unprecedented for law enforcement and for public officials to be frustrated in counting the ballots. And so much of American history, public officials have done the frustrating and counting ballots and giving access, not only as judges making decisions against voting rights, but also um, on the ground. And so this is what I'm gonna focus on. And there's so many things to talk about this week. There's so many aspects of the debates about police brutality and the, and the questions about um, Black Lives Matter and what we do next. I'm gonna just draw on one piece of that that I think is the most relevant for an election over the next year. Uh, I'd also suggest two things. One is I'm going to be monitoring the chat room, uh, the, the chat space on Zoom to be taking questions. My intent is to speak for about 10 minutes to lay out the, 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 what I'm focused on with the election and to give ample opportunity for people to, to ask questions and chat. Um, and then I will turn to that with some help of the, the Tikkun Alam Steering Committee to, to focus on your questions. I'll be articulating, I'll be speaking out the question and then answering it, but it helps me to know what to focus on. And I acknowledge that this is only one aspect of the post-Minneapolis post uh, uprisings and uh, protests and questions about Black Lives Matter 
but I, we were going to have breakout rooms, as Fran noted, where we can dig into more deeply and have a chance to, uh, to share how we're feeling. Um, and so this is not meant to bring together all those themes, but to touch on the things that, some of the things that I'm most concerned about. So let me pivot to that question. So what, among the many things we saw this week, we, one thing we saw was, was how the federal government, instead of you being, instead of serving to protect protesters on the ground, which a half a century ago, that was the job of the, of the federal government and the Department of Justice in its most noble moments in the 1960s. I think we have signs, quite clear signs that the Department of Justice is being run in a, in a very different way. So there were debates that we know were happening within the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense about whether the Insurrection Act, a uh, statute that was passed almost exactly 200 years ago, uh, could be invoked to bring the military crashing down um, and marching on our cities. I think people need to be aware of how close that was. I, I, I can tell you that that was something that not only was on the front page, on the op-ed spaces of the New York Times, but it was a debate happening um, with behind closed doors. Uh, there were questions about the National Guard and, and not only the National Guard, but we now know that prison guards from the Federal Bureau of Prisons were, came in from hotspots of COVID-19, came into the cities to have um, their experience. What, what are the Bureau of Prisons guards trained for? Not for controlling, not for maintaining the peace in cities, but they're trained for prison riots. And that was the mentality. And we also saw many unmarked guards in unmarked cars descending on cities where there is so little accountability. We saw people being hauled out from protests at, by unmarked police officers. Uh, so this is not just a, a horror that we observed in June, it's perhaps a preview of October and November. So I'm gonna tie that into what I think is maybe the, the one, of, one job that we all can do, but let me take a step back and talk about a framework of campaigns. There are really three traditional steps that are a little different this year. So I use my whiteboard here. I hope everyone can see this. Maybe a thumbs up so I can see that people don't have a glare here. Good. And this is under 2020. This is like any year. We have a process of registering voters, number one. Number two, uh, and that, that registering voters happens all through the primary season, 2019 to 2020. That was well underway. Then we usually have the step of persuading or canvassing voters. Let me note that that job was one of the things that the Clinton campaign notably spent less attention to. There, the uh, Clinton campaign's assumption was this year there's a, such a stark distinction between the Clinton and Trump campaigns, they didn't really need to persuade people. We'll let historians debate about the wisdom of that decision, but there was a different problem in 2020. The different problem in 2020 is that canvassing and during a pandemic is more difficult. So what can we do? We can do what we keep doing about phone calls, but I'm gonna suggest that we also pay attention to the difficulties on GOTV getting out the vote step three. But there's also a mystery step I'm gonna to get to in a minute. There's a new step or one that I think is no, people have not paid, paid enough attention to. There's a step four. So let me first talk about the importance of registering, persuading, getting out the vote in the places that I think are the most important. So let me quickly share screen here to get to a place here. Do, do, do. Oops, that's not the, here we go. This is, I think this is a safe assumption about the state of play in America right now. I have I've shifted some states to blue that might be light blue and st states to red, but I think the bottom line here from this map are uh, that uh, Biden is, uh, and the Democrats are pretty close to 232 uh, electoral votes. And I think Trump starts off with 205. Oops, that, well, that accidentally, that's suddenly closed. So let me get back to my main, let me see. I think highlights, and this is good thing I, good thing I prepared in advance, because on the other side of my whiteboard is that same count. Okay, can everyone see this? There's a little bit of glare, but people, some people can see it. Let me bring, let me zoom in. Okay, so the zoom in here on blue, right? I want to highlight, I think lots of people have been talking about three states, the three states that were pivotal in 2016. 
Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And so I've got those numbers there. Everything's in red because these are the states that Trump won. And I'm using this, again, this is a nonpartisan talk, but what I'm doing here is highlighting which states are in play. And experts agree that we may have be focusing a little bit too much on these three Midwestern states. And a mistake that people made in 2016 was assuming that these three states could be coin tosses independently. They're probably gonna vote together. But there are three new states that I want people to think about. Flor these are the, this is the Sun Belt swing states. And that's Florida, North Carolina, and Arizona. Okay. So these are the six states. And there, of course, there are more states that are, could be in play. But if those states are in play, then the states I just mentioned, the three Midwestern states and the three Sun Belt states, if Texas and Georgia are in play, uh, then likely to already be in one camp, you know, to, to have already shifted. So here's what I'm gonna highlight now, coming back. And so the point is, there are these six states that I think the election will turn on. And so I think if we're, if we're thinking about people who care about votes counting, I'm going to, to turn my whiteboard around again. And I'm gonna highlight what we can be doing now. We should all be planning on getting our mail in, you know, not only registering others, but we should focus on our own possibility of make sure that we have our mail-in ballots. Why? Because if we care about every vote counting, I want to jump to number three and then mystery number four. Step number three is getting out the vote. There's another aspect to getting out the vote and that is poll watching. I want people to think about voting early, mailing in, and then planning to go to one of those six states. Planning to go to Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin in the Midwest, and or planning to go in the Sun Belt to Arizona, North Carolina, or Florida. And I'll tell you why, because Florida 20 years ago was the site of one of the most famous election crises. Uh, and what happened there? Well, there were stories about black precincts and police cars. This, is, this ties directly to the events of last week. There are anecdotes about police cars running their lights outside polling areas in Florida and in African-American precincts, given their historical experience with flashing sirens, there were stories that many African-American voters didn't vote because they were, there was an active police presence when the brother of a, of, a, of a presidential candidate was on the ballot. Now, one reason why we have those anecdotes with not, without much enforcement is that people don't always listen to people of color when they report things. One privilege, and let me talk for a minute about white privilege. One privilege that our community has, and don't get me wrong, I'm not assuming that everyone who's a member of TBZ is white or everyone on the Zoom call is white, but I am, and many of us are. And one aspect of white privilege is that when we show up, when white people show up to protect the ballot, it changes the dynamic on the ground, right? People listen, the police maybe listen or maybe see that there are, uh, there, there's a different demographic than the one they expected. So one thing I wanna highlight is getting out the vote and poll watching by going to one of those states so that what happened in Florida in 2000 doesn't happen again. But what's my question mark here? The question mark is that it doesn't end on November 3rd. Election day is November 3rd. Okay, let me come up here. And let me give a little bit of a, of a timeline, quick timeline here. On November 3rd is election day. But then the key period that we want, I want to remind people of what happened in 2000 is between November 3rd and December 14th is when the votes have to get counted so that December 14th at state capitals all over the country, the electoral votes are counted on the state level. And then on January 6th, they show up in DC and in Congress, they count those ballots. So here's what no one is talking about, not at least publicly, and it's a problem. The key moment is step number four. After people vote at the ballot box, there's a gap between when people cast their votes live then there are several days where all these mail-in votes have to get counted. 
there is going to be a fight like none other. Keep in mind what has to happen, this new opportunity with mail-in votes. Lawyers can slow down that process. Lawyers can intervene to make sure, uh, oh, we have to check the signatures. We have to make sure that these mail-in votes. So here's what happened in 2000 in Florida. When it was clear that the election was close between hundreds of votes, uh, the process, uh, what was called the Brooks Brother Riot happened, where private lawyers descended on Florida and made it impossible for the canvassers to have space to count the ballots and lawyers slow down the process. And those lawyers almost ran out the clock. What would have happened is that that vote would have, if they had stopped Florida from counting, no one would have gotten to a majority, neither Gore nor Bush would have gotten to a majority of the Electoral College. So let me slow down here, right? We all know that the magic number is 270. But if no one gets to 270 by jet, by in, in between the state capital vote of December 14th and the showing up in Congress, the Constitution says it gets kicked into the House of Representatives. And it is not a vote by member. We, it's very likely that Democrats will have a majority of the two of the, of the 435 members, but that's not how it's counted. It's counted state delegation by state delegation. And no matter what happens, there will be something like 30 states by, of one party and 20 states controlled by the other party. And that means that the House will be able to vote for that party. Okay, so, so the goal may be, what we've seen this week, is that the police and the Department of Justice can use their power to slow down what happens in cities, right? To, to, to shift who goes where in cities, and then, to, and then lawyers and officials can slow down the counting process so that none of our votes count, except the, the, the 30 state delegations that will choose the next president. If you care about democracy, if you care about your vote counting, vote mail in early, number one. Then go plan, number, step number two, go think about a state you can get to of those six, Pennsylvania, with Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Florida, or Arizona. Go there and be a poll watcher. Use your white privilege for protecting the ballot and then cancel your Thanksgiving plans. There's gonna be a spike in COVID anyway, but you can, thank, you can give thanks for your right to vote by being part of an army of citizens who are trying to make sure that every vote gets counted so we can learn from what happened in Florida in 2000 and we don't, ha don't see it happen again in 2020. All right, so that's how we protect democracy. All right, let me see if there are uh, some, uh, some, some questions. I, the first thing I see on the, in the chat, and I, only, I, I wanna, second one person asks um, can I explain again how a vote in the house works okay let me be clear we ordinarily think of the house as voting member by member 435 members and the goal is to get to 218 or so to get a majority that is not how this vote works the original constitution and the 12th amendment say that the vote is by state delegation so Mississippi and Alaska count as much as California, Massachusetts, and New York. There are 30 states that are going to be run by one party in the House, and that's not Massachusetts. I'll put it that way. So, so uh, we all, everyone knows that if this vote gets kicked into the House, when, uh, when let's say, so, so here's what happens. Many of the states I talked about, like all six states I mentioned, the three Midwestern states and the three Sunbelt states, the good news is that they all have mail-in voting. They all already do. There's no fight to create mail-in voting. But the problem I'm highlighting, there are two problems. One is that mail-in voting might be better for a pandemic, but it also means that there's a league, there could be legal challenges to whether these votes have the right signatures. It's an opening for lawyers from one party to descend on that state and contest every vote. If one set of lawyers is there, but not the other set of lawyers, if one set of citizens is marching, but not another, one, one set of interests is going to prevail over the others. That's why we have to be citizens who are vigilant at this moment. 
And the second thing I just want to note is that any, any state, most states have a rule that there's an automatic recount if the vote is within 1%. I think it's very likely that of these six states, that one of these states that will decide the election will be within 1%. And anytime there's an automatic recount, there will be a fight amongst lawyers and citizens to protest, to make sure that what, whose votes get counted. So I'm pointing out here that even though it's great that in a pandemic, the key states have mail-in voting, there will be a fight in between, again, November 3rd of election day, all the way to December 14th about how to count those mail-in ballots. And so I'm suggesting here that we start planning now for that six week window to fight on the ground to make sure every vote is counted. All right, I think, uh, let me see if there are any other uh, questions here, uh, but I think, um, I think that's, a, uh, do, 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 okay. So what do we do between November 3rd and Thanksgiving? One thing I just, I, it's hard to know. Let me just point this out. I think we, we, I'm telling you where I think the six states are that will be the key swing states. So I, I, what I'm suggesting is that you start thinking now about being a poll watcher in any of those six states. But we won't know until after that day, until November 4th, which state might be the one that's legally in play. So I'm not telling you where to go, but I'm suggesting that you make, that you start thinking now about, about taking time in November and December to go to one of the, any one of those states. Because just like in 2000, where one state meant everything, it's quite possible that in November and in, into early December, one of those states will be the decisive state. All right. Um, so let me see if, I think I've got a few more minutes uh, uh, for some Q&A. Uh, let's see, just, um, so someone asks about uh, fighting on the ground. What do I mean by that? I really mean metaphorically. But let me, like, I think for members watching 2000, it was hard, what, what, what the, the what happened intimidated by a, a fleet of, of white lawyers in ties and protesters outside the canvases who were canvassing them they were Jed Jed and that's why in all likelihood Jed? Jed, can you hear me? We're, we're losing a lot, half of what I you're saying. Uh, we're losing some of what oh, you're I'm saying. I, I think your connection is going a little, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. So let me, if that's happening now, I actually think this is a fine opportunity to, 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 to just wrap up and say, I guess all I'm suggesting is that the same kind of, people can give me a thumbs up if they can hear me now. Uh, it doesn't sound like, so maybe this is a chance, okay, maybe this is a good opportunity to wrap up and, and move to breakout rooms um, and have a chance to have a conversation, okay? I think maybe that's the, that. could people hear me now? Thumbs up? Yeah, we heard you. We heard you. Thank you. All right. We so heard let, me, let me hand back, baton back. Um, and to shift to discussion, and I'll have a chance to wrap up later. Yeah. Thank you, Jed. I'll take it because we're hearing it. So we're going now into uh, breakout rooms. Uh, there are uh, so many of us, and there are 10 breakout rooms uh, with between uh, um, uh, seven to nine people, depending on the breakout rooms, and in each one there is a facilitator, so they'll tell you what's happening. So go and enjoy. You have to accept going into the breakout rooms.
Okay, so um, we're all back. Um, I hope that the breakout session, um, the chance to talk with each other, um, led to some um, interesting ideas, some um, sharing, some new learning. In my group, um, I was elected to be the one to, to give a little bit of a feedback. What we're gonna do is go to each of the facilitators and um, either have them or have somebody from their group um, uh, tell us in one minute or less um, a summary of your conversation. So in, in my group, um, it was, I thought, very um, interesting and um, very telling that there was a lot of um, fear, terror, and panic that came from the ideas that Jed presented. And, and even though there was, that led to um, um, conversations about what we could do um, to get people out to vote, to actually have an impact um, through postcarding, through making phone calls. Um, so um, the, the negative emotions actually led to ideas about action. Um, so let's hear from um, Judy, Judy Sheckman next. I'm gonna unmute you. No, you can't unmute oh. her, but. Oh, okay, could you unmute her? Somebody yeah. else? Okay. Try again. Judy's not unmuted yet. There she goes. Okay. Okay. So now that you've unmuted me, can you un unmute Shoshana, who's going to speak for our group? Great. So, and what I suggest to all the um, people, right, uh, leaders of the groups, write in the chat right. who is your person. So then we don't need to go back and forth and we can just unmute directly the person who is representing. So Judy, okay. your person is Shoshana, right? Hi. Um, so I think we might have had kind of a smallish group. Um, and we, I think we echoing what Tali just said, there's just a lot of anxiety and concern about um, the election in November, in addition to heightened concern for what's happening right now, but some hope about what's happening now that it's um, encouraging people to pay attention and maybe to be activated. Um, the one, one important question that came up was um, what folks who are not, you know, like I think people heard the call from Jed, we got to get out there on the streets and lots of people aren't going to be able to do that, especially to go to, to travel. And so kind of how to feel um, empowered and how to feel like there are still things that will be helpful if, if we can't do that. Um, and I think that, that that's basically what we were talking about. Thank you, Shoshana. Um, next, we're going to have uh, Larry Krauss speaking for Jonathan Klein's group. No, I'm sorry, for uh, Jed Sugarman's group. So we were part of Jed Sugarman's group, so we got a uh, more in-depth uh, conversation about Jed's ideas. I, as a lawyer, will say that a shout out for the 12th Amendment, something I've never, ever, ever thought of in my life, the 12th Amendment. No, I didn't remember that one. So uh, we talked about not only the ability and the importance of traveling to states where there needs to be voter protection, but Jed was also speaking about postcarding, which is something we all can do and something that uh, he was speaking as, as, as another effective way to, to uh, express ourselves. Okay, thank you, Larry. Um, next, we're going to hear for, from Rosalind for her group. It's Jane Daniels is going to speak for our group. Uh, oh, okay. Jane Daniels for Rosalind's group. Hi. Um, we, uh, you know, similarly, um, the first response said it's the situation is terrifying. Um, and we talked a lot about, um, you know, the difficulty that some of us might have in, in traveling other places, um, which then turns to what can we do? 
Um, and we talked about, you know, a, a big piece is voter education and outreach, just letting people even know, like we're just finding out about, um, you know, th that this uh, vote could get thrown to the house and then figuring out ways that we can using phone banks, postcards, technology, social media, anything that we can do um, to reach out to others in these states um, and figure out how to plug into organizations um, that are going to mobilize us around this. Thank you, Jane. Mm -hmm. um, next, we're going to hear from um, Jen Wolford for Fran Adams Group. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. Fran uh, led us beautifully. Weighing on people's hearts a lot is racial injustice and, and uh, harm done to African Americans. And ideas included state legislative issues, um, I mentioned school to prison pipeline. A lot of us really also expressed a desire to take up the call from Jed, beautifully put forward to us, and go to states and work. But people expressed specific questions about safety, uh, being older, not being under 50, you know, not even being under 60, and those uh, concerns. And then we looked a little macro and micro uh, levels of work. So I thought it was beautifully done discussion. This is a fabulous evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to hear from Ronnie, Le um, Ronnie Levine for Carol Kamen's group. So we did exactly the same thing. Started out with terror, questions about whether we were going to be able to travel. And something that Carol mentioned is that there is Vote Save America Adopt a State, where you can sign up to sort of be a foster member of that state. And they will tell you what needs to be done for those states. But pretty much the same discussion in our group as Shoshana and everybody else. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, next, we're going to hear from Julia Friedson for Julia's group. Hi, I'm, I'm elected as my group. Um, I think it's getting a little repetitive, so I'll keep it, I'll keep it brief. But I, I, I heard um, a lot of um, discouragement over the eye-opening presentation that Jed gave us about the potential for corruption and uh, things going off the tracks during the election cycle. Um, but there was also some hopefulness about the authenticity of the um, the anti racist movement that's growing and um, some sort of some feelings that maybe it'll be different this time and and things will go in a better direction. And all of that is um, sort of under this overarching cloud of COVID and um, how that is going to prevent some people from being able to travel and do the work that they might be able to do um, otherwise. And, you know, some, some thinking about alternative ways of working given, given the, the pandemic. Thank you, Julia. Um, next, we're going to hear from Jonathan Klein for his group. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I um, screwed up and didn't ask anyone to um, be a spokesperson, so it ended up being me. Um, we had a really powerful discussion, um, and it, it more of a just each of us sharing our feelings and emotions. And the overwhelming, you know, everyone is in an emotional and complicated and difficult state. Don't have to say that. The thing that struck me the most was the idea, and this is actually from, um, from Nikki, Nikki um, Horberg, that um, this is a horribly scary time with the possibility that we are descending into authoritarianism and it is a amazingly hopeful time with the possibility of transformation. And it's that idea of transformation that I'm personally holding on to and think that we're about here tonight and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that was, that's what I took away from it. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so next, we're going to hear from um, Joel uh, Kirshner for Susan Bookbinders Group. Okay. 
I'm muted. There we go. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Um, I, I, I would just be mirroring what everyone else said. Um, so may I'll, I'll just try to add something a little different. Uh, one of our members uh, talked about early voting in Massachusetts. Uh, I think it would be good for us to, for, I'd like to know whether early voting is something that happens in many other states, because then you could go when there aren't so many people to the polls and, uh, and maybe avoid the issues that Jed pointed out about absentee voting. Um, I would, um, I guess I would add the same voice about being terrified what, what could go wrong and say, okay, let's take action, the action we can take tomorrow. No one knows what the next few months will bring and there'll be people planning to, so that we can rely on. We don't all have to worry or plan for it. Um, and I wanna throw in one thing that didn't come up in the group, but environmental voter project is an excellent way of reaching out to voters that I'm involved in as well. Thanks. Thank you, Joel. Um, and finally, we have uh, Ravti Ferret um, for her group. Um, so our group you know, said a lot of what was echoed. Some of the things that are new is that, you know, thinking about how do we, how do we get out and protest and demonstrate and balance that with our need to protect our loved ones from COVID and not bring that home. Um, and also people shared what they're already working on and their own commitments that they're already taking part in. And there was a lot of praise for TBZ's uh, Tikkun Olam group being so clear about what are the actions that we can take and what are the next steps because we only have so much time. And there was a lot of appreciation for Jed and all that he shared. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. So I think I'd like to um, bring it back to Jed to have the last words. Well, uh, wor last words before Fran, I think. I, uh, for, for this part of the presentation. For this part, sure. Um, thank you. I, the, the conversation that we had in our group was, was really powerful, and I appreciate that we had a chance for lots of people to jump in here. Um, let me say, first of all, a couple of questions that came up in this big group and in my smaller conversation. I want to be clear. People ask me, well, can I give them specific organizations where I can send them for concrete next steps? I'm, I'm, I'm being very intentional about making this a nonpartisan talk. You all can talk to others offline from this and find out which organizations, and frankly, they are mostly partisan organizations. So I think you can take the next step and um, TB, look, TBZ as, a, as an organization can't do it, but TBZ members can. And so talk to each other about which organizations protect the vote, get, organize for mailing in the vote. And this is especially important for the people that has expressed concerns about travel. Everything you can do from today until November 3rd, you can do uh, until November 2nd, until the day of election day, you can do from home. The point I was trying to emphasize about what makes this election, you know, why is this election different from all other elections? It's because we're shifting from in-person voting to an emphasis on mail-in voting and it's new territory for lots of people. Here, registering and persuading canvassing and getting out the vote, a lot of that can happen from your own home. And will people, you know, how, how effective is it? Getting a postcard from someone, from you, if you mail your postcard to someone about the next steps, it makes it a little easier for at least one person to know what their next step is and get their mail-in vote and take that step. Florida in 2000 was decided by, depending upon how you count, 200 voters. How many people are on this call tonight? I count 64 participants. Let me imagine that some of them are two people here. If each of us, get postcards to many people and we just get two people to mail in their vote, that means that the Florida of 2000 that, that voted for one person for president flips the other way, right? So you can take that, if, if you don't, if not now, when? So I also wanna, so that, so I wanna highlight, if you can't travel, that's all that much more you can do now to figure out what the organizations are and spend your time at home with postcards. And you know what? 
calling people's cell numbers, leaving messages. It may not make a difference with every call, but just one call out of 10, one call out of 100 can, can change that Florida election. But one of the main things I heard, uh, secondly, I just wanna highlight all six states that I mentioned. Again, the, think of it this way, it's an easy mnemonic. They're the three Midwestern states that Trump, that Trump won. Those three states are Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, the three upper Midwest states, and, and the three Sunbelt states, North Carolina, Florida, Arizona, all six of them have mail-in voting. People were worried two months ago during pandemic, for the first wave of the pandemic, thinking, oh my goodness, we have to fight for states to change their election rules. It turns out pleasantly a su pleasant surprise is that the, the key states I'm highlighting now all already have those rules in place, which, mean that, which means that you can tomorrow start figuring out how you take those rules that are in place and educate voters. And that's the last thing I wanna to pivot to, which is the optimism and hope that we can already have. So, the, so one piece of good luck is that the key states already have mail-in voting and Massachusetts already has flexible absentee voting. You can do this without having to fight for that structural change. You can mobilize yourself, but there's so much reason for optimism. I'm not gonna highlight, you can, you can Google the polls, but one, some of the things that make me optimistic are that when I look at the polling data on, on the police violence, 60% of the public, more or less, is siding with the protesters as opposed to, as opposed to the crackdown. If you experience the, LA, the, the, the Rodney King beating the way that I did, was shock at the way that the public didn't take Rodney King's side and took the LAPD side 30 years ago. I am, am what gives me hope that public opinion is seeing things differently in 2020. The ground is set for a transformative election without getting partisan. Uh, I, see, I see lots of hope that the facts on the ground are positive but we have to turn that public opinion into votes, step one, and then step two to make sure those votes are counted. That is a fantastic position to be in, but we have to know what those steps are. So just to wrap up, people are asking what step four was, right? I've already talked about register, meet, register, persuade, and get out the vote. You can do that in a, in a, in a COVID-19 world of, of postcards, and, and persuading people about how to, and, and informing people about how mail-in voting works. But keep in mind, my, the step four I'm talking about is protect the vote and make sure every vote counts. Count all votes. That is a, that is a, that is a new issue to focus on this year for reasons that we've just seen about the way that the government is using uh, militarized officials to, to stop people from going out in public. That can happen in October, it can happen in November, but it can, the key thing is making sure every vote is counted between November and December. That was step four. And if you can get out there and do it, I just wanna suggest that it's, it might be, if you can do it carefully, the future of American democracy may turn on whether you're willing to get out there and take that risk. Let's also remember all the risk that you're thinking about with COVID-19, Watch the movie Selma. Think about the risks that people took for their votes in 1963, 1964, and 1968. If they didn't take a risk for being hit on the head with police batons and dogs being sicked on them, if they took that risk, then you and I can take that risk in 2020 because our lives not only depend upon the questions of public health, right? Our lives depend upon whether we have a democracy or not. So I think it's worth that risk. Okay, thank you, Jed. Um, I'm Jonathan, you've met me before and uh, that was really powerful and overwhelming. The first thing I, I need to note is that it's 8.06, and we told you that this would be from seven o'clock to eight o'clock, but we have been so engaged 
with Jed's talk, with the Q&A, and with the breakout rooms, that I'm going to ask everyone's permission to go another 15 minutes. So if you're able to do that and stay with us, that's great. I'm going to tell you what's coming up. If you have to step off, we understand that, you know, uh, but it's great having everyone here. So I'm going to talk about the action, about the postcards that we planned for tonight. Um, I'm then going to move to a transition. We called this Pathways to Tikkun Olam, and we have four specific pathways that we're going to talk about. One is the postcarding, um, and then we're going to have a wrap-up and a prayer. So stay with us for 15 minutes if you can. I promise you it will be worthwhile. So we have been working with JALSA Impact, the Jewish Alliance for Law and Social Action, and with Reclaim Our Vote, which is a 501c3 organization, which means that they're nonpartisan, and which means as a synagogue, we can work with them so we don't have to worry about any of the lines that Jed is trying to waltz around here. They are completely legit for us to work with. And what they are doing is working mostly in Southern states, mostly in communities of color, in um, cooperation with the NAACP um, to find voters who are being tossed off the rolls. You've all heard about many states that are trying to find voters that may not have voted in two years or four years or may have moved and kicked them off the rolls. And they are working primarily to identify those voters, find ones who are likely to be kicked off or may have been kicked off. And then we are writing postcards to them that say, you may have been removed. You're, you were registered to vote and you may have been removed from the registration. And when you show up at the polls, you may not get to vote. So please call this number or contact this website and make sure you're registered. And that's a really valuable thing to do. And it's a really easy thing to do. And it makes a huge difference. And Reclaim Our Vote is mining the Secretary of State's offices you know, all across the country. We've been working mostly in North Carolina, which is one of Jed's big six states. We've also been working in Georgia. Uh, we've been working in Texas. So those are the places we're doing it. Now, so many people are doing this activity that we've had a big run on postcards. And so we were not able to deliver all the postcards we promised. And I apologize for all the confusion around that. And I beg and thank you for your indulgence as we work through the mechanics of this. But you know, this is an activity that we can continue from now through till election day. And we intend to continue working with JALSA Impact and with Reclaim Our Vote to do it. I want to give a big shout out to Margie Siegel, uh, who is here and who has been doing yeoman's work, yay Margie, behind the scenes, um, packaging all those postcards. So we had about 80 of you that asked for postcards. We were able to supply about 10 postcards instead of 30 to about 60 of you. And every single package that was made up, Margie's the one that wrapped it and put a rubber band around it and put all the pieces in it. So thank you, Margie, for doing all that. Um, It'll take you about 30 minutes. If some of you have done it, that's great. If you have comments about it or questions, put them in the chat and I'll try to answer them. Because we're short on time, I don't wanna take time here to, to, to have a conversation. But I wanna say two more things. One is, if you didn't get your postcards, if you're one of the people that we didn't send them to, and I sent you an email about that, we will be sending you in about a week or a week and a half and we'll let you know that you can either pick them up at TBZ or get them delivered, a package of 30 postcards. So they will come. If you did get 10 postcards, I need you to get back to me and say, I still want more. Okay, so if you got your 10 postcards, I'd like to ask you if you can to please complete them in the next two days or so. We'd like to get them in the mail. So it should only take you about 30 minutes. Um, get them in the mail by say Wednesday night. Um, and then if you want more, if you want to stay on the program of getting more, send me an email and you all have my email, you know how to find me. So that's all I'm going to say about this right now. Um, and um, we had hoped we would have time to kind of sit around and write postcards together. And there's been so much amazing content that I think that's been more important than that. But the important thing is to take every action we can. And we will be doing postcards, we'll be doing texting, we may be doing phone banking, and we'll be doing it all through Reclaim Our Vote, which is nonpartisan, so we can do that legitimately as a synagogue and a 501c3. Okay, look at the chat. Okay, uh, all right. Um, uh, can you just buy your own postcards is a question. Can you get more? Yes, if you want more, send an email to me, number one. And number two, um, there are instructions, but if you have any questions about the instructions, 
send an email to me or to Margie Siegel. Okay. All right. I'm out of time. Um, we are moving on to pathways to Tikkun Olam. And there are four pathways we're going to do. No, Fran? Oh. Muted. Okay. We're turning it over to Fran, who is going to introduce the next section. Fran, you're muted again. Muted. Fran is muted. Uh, Rapti Ferret? No? Yep. I'm unmuted. Okay, thank you very much. Jonathan actually made the transition for us by offering up the first action that we are offering for the future. And that is a new way to do postcarding, especially for those who have been doing them for the last three years with Julia and I. Your new best friends are Jonathan and Margie and go for it. That is number one. Our second person who's gonna be presenting a pathway is Rosalind Joffe, who I just wanna say is so devoted that on her 40th anniversary, which is today, she is postponing all of her plans to be with her husband, to be with all of us. So that's the kind of devotion we have in this group. Thank you, Rosalind. Not like we were, tra we were traveling to Paris. <laughs> the GPIO membership is actually launching a listening campaign tomorrow, Tuesday, June 9th from 5.30 to 6.30. And in this virtual convening, we're gonna reflect and hear primarily from our GBIO black leaders, which if you have been to a GBIO action late in the last couple of years, we've, many of us have commented on how there hasn't been a lot of them. And this year we've really devoted and worked to get a whole new contingent of people in invoices. And they're going to tell us about what this moment of moral crisis is doing in their communities and how much this kind of action means to them. And we're gonna talk about the crisis that's going on around the police murder of George Floyd and the ongoing pandemic, which has disproportionately taken lives black men and women are in our commonwealth. We'll also get an update on what's happened in the negotiations with Governor Baker, then a President Karen Spilka, district attorneys and sheriffs. And finally, we're going to propose a platform for strategic and powerful action in which we're going to mobilize across the commonwealth to demand racial justice from our state legislature through in-district meetings and primary candidate forums. Our issues will include police reform and oversight and statutory limits on police use of force, affordable health care when people need it more than ever, including affordable and accessible prescription drugs, mental health treatment, and an end to surprise out-of-network billing, decarceration of state prisons, and increased investment in reentry preparation programs. And finally, any other issues that emerge from this listening campaign that we're, we're starting on now. So we really do hope that you will join us. It's just one hour and GBO is good at keeping to its word, but you must pre-register to join. And if you don't have the link, please email me. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rosalind. Um, let's hear from Jonathan again on a new initiative. So many of you know that I've been very engaged in affordable housing and we've been working very hard in Brookline and I apologize to those of you outside of Brookline on a Brookline initiative to transform the conversation around affordable housing. One of the huge issues in housing has been racial segregation over a long, long, long period of time and reversing that, making housing affordable and creating a diverse Brookline is a huge lift. Um, we have um, set up a large townwide forum that's gonna happen this coming Sunday from one to 3 p.m. called Building a Better Brookline, Housing Affordability in the Age of COVID. And it's gonna start with a whole discussion of the history of racial discrimination and how that's affected what our community looks like and then move on to talk about barriers and solutions. Uh, I've been very integral in planning this with a lot of other people around town it's going to be a real opportunity to transform the conversation. And I would love to have as many TBZ members as possible 
uh, who have been with me in all the other affordable housing things we've done participate in this new initiative. I will be sending out emails to Kehila and to our mailing lists with links so that you can sign up. It's Sunday from one to three. You'll get the opportunity for a link and I would love to see as many of you as possible there. If you have any questions at all, just email me and I'd be happy to talk to anyone about it. So that's an opportunity to be somewhere where we will make a difference um, in transforming our community. Back when I was a kid in college in the 70s, we said, think globally and act locally. So this is acting locally. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I just want to remind people, we have an awful lot of info in the chat section. You will have access to all of that. All of this is being recorded and you'll be able to get all of that. There's some great um, questions. If you are mentioning an action and can put a link into the chat now, all the better so that people can can have that information right away. This is our last initiative that we're highlighting tonight, and then we're gonna wrap up the evening. Susan Bookbinder. Hi, everybody. Um, many of you know that last year we started to think about doing some real anti-racism work here at TBZ. And we had a lot of plans, but it, you know, COVID-19 got in our way. So um, we're starting up again anyway. The first thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to start our book reading group, which I'm, a lot of people have shown an interest in. You can register through um, TBZ Happenings, which came out this week. I've heard that sometimes it's been hard to register. And in that case, go straight to Rev Tiferet and tell her that you want to register and we can get the book for you through Brookline Booksmith. It will be three Thursday nights starting this Thursday, and you don't have to have started the book yet. Um, from there, we have many, many plans to move forward. Next fall, we're going to give the uh, Kavod is going to give us um, their anti-racism workshop training, which is fantastic, through a Jewish lens. You'll hear about that over the summer, so you know, probably right after the holidays is when it's going to start. Um, we're going to we're going to be having um, the book group will continue all summer. I mean, we need to keep educating ourselves. We are going to be putting things in happenings every week, little articles, links to articles and podcasts that you can listen to, um, and we can form our own groups to talk about them. And we're going to figure out a way that when actions are needed locally we will let everybody know and we can go together with our TBZ banner. We're going to make anti-racism part of who we really are very explicitly. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I think you're gonna have a tremendous amount of interest in that. Um, so I give my heartfelt thanks to, certainly to Jed for, for so much fantastic information tonight and to everyone else who participated. And that means everybody who is on the call tonight. We all heard a call to action tonight. When we began planning this event, which was many months ago, it got postponed. All of the issues that we talked about tonight already felt urgent, but none of us could have possibly imagined that we'd be in the midst of a mass social protest movement taking on no less than systemic racism and the brutality of the criminal justice system, all while a global pandemic is going on. So as frightening, disorienting, and emotionally draining as this time may be and sometimes feels, it suddenly to me feels hopeful. I do love a demonstration. It feels <laughs> that we, possibly are finding our power and uniting and that we will take on with the same urgency, climate change, guns on our streets, a personnel change in the White House, and so much more. So final words, if you have any questions still about how to participate, please reach out to anyone on the steering committee all of our names are in the directory, we're in, we're all, it's all over the place, or Ralph Claudia will get it to you. Or better yet, feel free to join one of our meetings. We meet once a month and our meetings are open. 
The bottom line is that when we look back at this moment, when we face our children, our students, our grandchildren, we want to be able to tell them that we were not silent, that we spoke up for justice, that we took action. Thank you. Thank you all so, so very much. So I just want to close with a, a short blessing for all of us that um, we all hold on to that optimism and not confuse it with overconfidence. That we have the inner calm to know that we don't have to do everything, but we have to do something. And may the Holy One of Blessing give us the strength to do exactly what we can. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Thank you, everybody.